teamwork. Hopefully that is what you're here for. If not, welcome anyways. <laughs> Just going to give one more minute for people to trickle in. discovered a new thing. Alrighty, in these last 30 seconds, I'll just go ahead and introduce myself. I'm Katherine Grossman. I'm one of the graduate teaching and learning specialists at CTERRA L. Shed, will you introduce yourself? Hi everyone, my name is Shed, like the thing in your backyard. I go by she or they pronouns and I am a teaching and learning specialist at the CTRL. Wonderful. So these are our general guidelines for participation. You may have seen this before if you've attended one of our workshops, um, but we really want you to make yourself comfortable as you're enjoying this workshop with us. So, you know, feel free to stem, rock, fidget, knit. Um, I'm a big fan of Play-Doh. I like to tactilely engage in addition to visually and auditorially participating. Um, be present in whatever way works for you. We're gonna have some chat check-ins, we're gonna have some breakout rooms and uh, please engage with whatever way makes you feel the most comfortable. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to ask those questions. You can raise your hand um, if you're gonna ask the general audience or feel free to share ideas in the chat. Um, and as always, just be generous with your knowledge and respectful of each other's knowledge. So you may have reviewed our workshop outcomes before attending today, but hopefully by the end of this workshop, you will be able to articulate how collaborative norm setting and pre-planning can help create a productive teamwork environment. Um, you can also consider common challenges to teamwork and group projects, and we're gonna help provide some strategies for how to address those. And finally, we're going to develop approaches to tackle teamwork and group projects throughout the semester to facilitate an enjoyable experience for both students and instructors. Shed, do you have anything to add in terms of workshop outcomes and what we hope in terms of facilitating collaborative norm setting? <laughs> All right, well then to kick things off, we're gonna do a quick warm up chat. So if you, as you contribute, just throw your information in the chat, feel free to introduce yourself and share your pronouns. And our question is, what is a primary student challenge that you've encountered in group work or teamwork? What's something that your students have shared with you that has been a challenge? Sonia mentions being taken over. So one student being dominant, delegation can be an issue. Dan says group think. Definitely. Classic from Sydney. One student freeloading and the other's getting frustrated, of course. That may have been us, uh, not the freeloader necessarily, but we may have been the person in the group who picked up all the slack. And so maybe that's familiar to us. Equity in terms of contributions, equal participation. Even finding a time to meet can be difficult, especially outside of the classroom. We're all incredibly busy. Lots of frustration and conflict about students pulling their own weight, feeling that their opinions are being ignored. Maybe it's a, a popularity contest, as Gina suggests. So yeah, these are all a lot of challenges that students encounter. So what we're hoping to get to in this workshop is transitioning from challenges to potential solutions. And this is kind of a broad overview and we're going to go into each of these individual topics throughout the course of this workshop. But a very common challenge with students is frustration and um, uncertainty about why they're being put into groups or teams. 
um, or feeling like the assignment of groups is arbitrary. So we're going to be talking a lot about deliberately arranging groups um, and talking and being transparent with your students about why a team or group project um, is valuable to them as a student um, and to the initial product or to the eventual product in terms of the assessment. Um, and also lack of instructor guidance is often a common frustration for students. So we're going to be talking about transparency and making sure that we are providing uh, guidance to our students, um, which will also help us along the way. And then finally, um, we talked a lot about imbalance of effort not being accounted for. So staying involved throughout the process and helping facilitate and guide group projects with your students. So to start off, we just want to kind of differentiate between group work and teamwork. We're going to be using them interchangeably throughout this. Um, but in general, group work is often applicable to short-term kind of discussion, weekly discussion-based environments. The group size and composition can change depending on the course or discussion. And these are generally utilized for more formative assessments. So discussion, end of class presentations, things like that. Um, whereas teamwork is often thought of for longer term projects. So kind of your end of term presentations or um, papers. And so the group size is generally more restricted than with group work. Um, the composition is generally consistent. So it's something that is set early on in the semester and then continues throughout and is generally utilized for more summative assessments. So finals, um, team projects, things like that. But our preference is actually teamwork versus group work because when we're talking about collaborative norm setting, we want words like team because they signify more cohesion, more collaboration, more interdependence. Um, you're working towards a common goal or purpose or outcome. Um, so for us, teamwork makes more sense, even in what is often considered group work environments, um, because we want to create these cohesive teams that are exhibiting trust and encouragement with each other. There's a sense of shared ownership and everyone feels like they have uh, equal space to express their ideas and opinions. Shed, do you have anything to add on teamwork versus group work? I, I just really, I really love that point that you made that how we frame it to students is how they <laughs> receive it, right? So if we frame it as an opportunity for them to establish like a team, I think that will be very different than saying, okay, you're going to be in groups for this project. Um, so I really like your framing of that, Catherine. So when we're developing our courses and we're looking at our syllabi and we're trying to decide whether or not a project should be a teamwork project, I just really want to emphasize the point that we can't assess where we're all accomplished um, and uh, instructors in this room we can't assess anything that we don't teach. We know that's going to lead to frustration for our students and for us as instructors, because when it gets time for grading something, if the students don't have an understanding of why the teamwork is applicable to the project, then it's going to be a nightmare facilitating and grading students. So we really wanna make sure that we're helping guide our students through the teamwork process. Um, so in order to do that, we need to help guide them through the collaboration process and practice collaboration skills with them. Um, and this can start when we're developing our learning outcomes. Um, so as we're looking through our learning outcomes when we're developing our syllabi, we need to make sure that team and group work projects align with those course objectives. And then we need to look and see, is this the kind of project that actually necessitates multiple individuals contributing? Is this something that is going to contribute to either the process uh, skills and knowledge that students are going to be developing in the course or the eventual product in the assessment. Um, if students don't know how or why they're collaborating, then it's not going to be a successful um, experience for either the student or the instructors. So in line with this, our chat check-in is asking you to recall a positive teamwork experience. So what was a positive experience that you had in a team environment? 
and that can be something to model and express to your students in the classroom. We can just throw it in the chat. I love this point. Oh, sorry. Did I speak? No, 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 Chad. <laughs> sorry. Different members contributed with their unique and different strengths. I love that. I mean, that's what we want our students to do, right? Um, works and commissions trying to solve a particular problem. Yeah, yeah. A, a common goal, I think, is is another way to think of that. That's an excellent point. Let's see what some other folks think. Um, Assigning different roles within the study. It's a great approach. Absolutely. And also feeds into what Sahil said in terms of catering to different skills and knowledge. I hope everyone's able to remember a positive teamwork experience. It could be from any time. There's mm, common goals again, love that. And also connecting to course objectives and outcomes. These are things that they're going to experience outside the classroom. And it's a, the classroom can be a safe and productive place to practice and model these skills and objectives. To-do lists and learning how to delegate. It's a practice I, I continue to work on. <laughs> and then Mac talks about setting expectations for how to work together. So this, this goes back to collaborative norm setting and teaching students how um, to productively work together. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to hand it over to Shed to talk about benefits of teamwork. Yeah, and I love these, uh, yeah, uh, some folks organizing CTRL events. Yes, absolutely. We love working with you on that. If you have the chance to join us, we, we, would, we love working with you on that. Working on a team worksheet, I love that idea. Um, Michelle, we're going to talk a little more about about exactly that. So I'm glad you brought that up. So these are probably more obvious to us, but I think it's useful. Sorry, I just caught a gnat in front of my face. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, to review some of those benefits of teamwork, which might be good for us to share with our students. So of course, creating a sense of community and connection among that group, um, stimulating and encouraging creativity, allow students to share diverse perspectives and approaches, which is part of why we want them to work together, right? To negotiate through that productively. Um, it can lead to more thoughtful, nuanced, and complex pro products or projects. And of course, it helps students build skills valued by employers. So we all have to work in teams and our professional lives in one way or another. So we want students to build those skills before they enter the workforce. Um, so how do we set teams up for success? So Catherine has already mentioned some of these components, but we're going to break them down and go through how to enact each of them. So first, deliberately numbering and arranging groups is going to be really important. Not that there's a magic number, but rather um, making an informed decision based on the context of your class. Practicing transparency, always an excellent pedagogical strategy, staying involved with your students' groups, and including opportunities for assessment and reflection from your students. So let's break each of these down um, into strategies. So let's start with deliberately arranging our groups. So we want to make sure that the number of students in each group is based on the assignment type and the expectations you have of them. Most research tells us that two to six students is a good number for a group and that six is basically the maximum. The reason being when you get more than six people, it's very hard to balance everyone's voices and time and needs. It just becomes kind of a, <laughs> what do you say, dog and pony show? <laughs> it becomes a mess, right? Um, so um, you can set group size limits in different platforms, like on Canvas, you can arrange groups by size. Um, on Zoom, you can create breakout rooms based on the number of people, et cetera. 
Um, and uh, so what does the project need? How many students should be working together on this type of project? And then what kind of roles can they use? So students consistently tell us they appreciate when they are offered roles, and that allows everyone to have very clear goals and contributions. If everyone picks a role, then they know exactly what's expected of them. And it's a lot harder for them to say, well, you know, there, we have an extra person who's not doing anything because everyone has a responsibility. And it's easier to reflect on whether you completed that responsibility or not. So some examples of roles would be recorder, mediator, skeptic, reporter. I mean, it really depends on the assignment you're doing. Um, and students can rotate those roles to practice different skills among the group if time permits. So we want to encourage students to choose from a certain number or certain list of roles that we think each group is going to need in order to function successfully. So let's experiment with this idea and tell me in the chat what you think. So first, what do you think is an appropriate group size for students writing a paper together? What is the range you would put? And remember, we're asking for two to six for any group project, but for, you know, teamwork writing a paper, Mike says two or three. Dan says that they like three. Okay, I'm seeing a trend, two to three. Okay, excellent, excellent. I don't think we've put an answer on here, <laughs> Catherine, but what do you, what do you think? I agree. We, I would, I would recommend on the lower end for papers. Um, I've certainly been, I've co-written papers with more than four people and it, it is a nightmare, both logistically and um, narratively. It can be very difficult to combine all those thoughts into one paper. And Catherine, you've pointed out to me in the past, if there's too many people writing a paper, they each might just write their own section and then smush it together, which is not really teamwork, right? Oh, I like this from Sonia. Six, only if you can break down into two separate subgroups. That's a great idea. So I think we totally agree. Less people for a paper because of the type of assignment. And then you could do more with, right, closer to four, five, six for a filming project because there's way clearer roles that everyone can take, director, producer, writer, whatever it might be. Um, and there's more, you know, more people involved is going to actually, could actually make filming a short video an easier and more productive process for everyone. So thank you for sharing your thoughts. All right. So we get to this classic question, do we put students in groups ourselves or do we let them choose their groups? So the eternal question, right? Um, something we recommend is asking your students for their preference. Sometimes they want to be assigned to groups and sometimes they wanna choose their own groups. Um, but if you are allowing students to choose their own groups, which we recommend, um, you should highly encourage them to work with others based on a shared interest or topic rather than with their friends. Because we know things get weird <laughs> when you work on a project with your friend. You may not be so focused and it can mess with your friendship. So encouraging students to cluster into a team based on the goal, the interest, the topic that they share. And you can offer things like a self sign up option on Canvas where students can voluntarily enter a group. Um, and you could also, if you want to assign students, you could assign them based on things like their prior knowledge, their experience and their skills. If they perhaps have a shared sense of motivation among that group um, or their familiarity with each other. So whatever you decide to do, um, what students consistently tell us is they like being grouped or being choosing groups based on the topic that is interesting and the shared goal. We really recommend against randomizing student groups since this is often this often is what leads to a lot of conflict among students is you know a sort of they're put together without really rhyme or reason and that can lead to a lot of conflict. And if they're not sharing a goal, then that's going to fall apart pretty quickly. Um, so there's a lot of different options for you there. Um, so just just something to think about. All right, so a note about equity here. We want to recommend against distributing diverse students among student groups. So, you know, diverse here is actually kind of euphemistic. It represents difference in the class. And so everyone, you know, there's no people who are diverse. Um, 
but uh, it's something to keep in mind is we don't want to leave our more marginalized students sort of spread across other student groups. Um, so you might say to yourself, you know, like, well, I want all of the groups to have some sense of diversity. I want there to be difference in the opinions and the conversation. But what research shows us is that our marginalized students can feel really unsafe when they're separated from one another. And in those small groups, you see the second bullet point, student teams often become a venue in which discriminatory behavior and microaggressions are expressed against marginalized students. And so it's really important to allow students to stay with groups identity-wise that might make them more comfortable if they're coming from a marginalized position, because being pulled away from that safety of people who share their marginalized identity can lead to a lot of internal and external conflict. Um, so just to read this quote from the Eberly Center, it's important to make sure, oh, sorry, <laughs> it's important to make sure there is critical mass in every group so that lone members of a particular social category, for example, among race or gender axes, do not find themselves isolated in a group. Um, and then, of course, we recommend collaborative norm setting within groups. So we'll share a little more about that. Um, so, uh, Sorry, <laughs> I thought the next slide was about that. My apologies, that's my mistake. So if you've ever tried norm setting with your students or setting collaborative guidelines, it's a great way for students to um, establish their own respectful conduct. And so you might ask your student group to set their own guidelines and how they're going to behave with each other, how they're going to behave respectfully, how will they resolve it if they disagree or fall behind, and let them establish their own sort of norms for their group. And that's going to make them a lot more accountable than if you just imposed norms on them. Okay, so our second facet here is practicing transparency. So some things for us to keep in mind, being mindful when developing the course of how assessments feed into course outcomes. So if you've ever worried about, you know, students saying, well, this feels like busy work, it's because when students think something is busy work, it's usually because they don't see the purpose of it and they don't see how it connects to the point of the course. So to avoid that label of busy work, it helps to clarify for students, why are you doing this? How does it connect to the course goals? How does it help you learn the skills that are important to the discipline, right? So be clear with students about why they're in groups and the core skills that they are supposed to be practicing in the group. It's going to make it a lot clearer to them what they're doing and why. So um, I, not all real world team situations are the same, right? In our workplaces, we know that each team situation is going to be different. So we don't want to assume that students will use the same teamwork skills in every teamwork context. So instead, we want to connect it to our course outcomes. So we might say, well, you know, students have to learn teamwork. But that's different in every discipline, in every class, in every context. So we want to tell students, what teamwork skills are you practicing in this class? What do they have to do with the discipline, the field of study, the um, topic of the course, the skills we're working on? And how can they witness their own teamwork growth by engaging in the project? So metacognition. So we'll also talk a little more later about what metacognition looks like for students in groups, but I do wanna keep an eye on the chat. Um, and then Michael makes a great point. If you assign midway through the semester a teamwork project, they're usually sitting with their friends, <laughs> yes. So it might be good to try and disrupt that a little bit by asking them to maybe submit a topic they're interested in, like, you know, maybe privately without their friends and then put students in group based on the topic that they, they named. All right. A few more points. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, a few more points here about practicing transparency. Um, of course, be clear with your students about how they are supposed to conduct themselves in their group. Um, if you don't set respectful guidelines with your students, that's a great opportunity to do it. Um, so not just encouraging groups to create guidelines, but you working with students to talk about, you know, how should we behave in this class and how should we behave in our groups? Um, make it clear to them how they're going to be evaluated. How will they evaluate each other or themselves? How will you evaluate them? Again, knowing the goalposts. If you know what is being expected of you and how you're being assessed, super helpful, right? It helps with motivation. If it's not clear how group work will connect to course outcomes and the skills students have been practicing, you might reconsider the assignment, right? So it's good for us to ask ourselves, really with every assignment, why this assignment? 
How is it helping students practice skills? How is it helping us reach the course outcomes? Yeah, Sahil, please go ahead. Yeah, hi, thanks. I just had a question about yeah. this point about evaluating each other. Um, so I've had my own experience in the past where when I was doing a group project, we were supposed to submit grades for our group members, which are then incorporated into the final assignment grade. And I remember back in my first year of undergrad, we just decided we'll just give everyone full marks without really grading them. Um, more recently, students have told me that they would have liked to see a peer review component, but I'm worried sometimes that creates this sense of competition that uh, among the group, it might be like a punitive thing because they have some control at the, at the same time, it may be a way to control the free rider problem. So I just wanted your thoughts and you know what current research uh, says about peer review components for group, uh, for group grading. And I just, yeah, I wanted to know what the state of the field is on that. That's a really good question. And we're going to talk more in a few minutes about that peer review component. Actually, if I'm remembering right, Catherine, we offer some different templates that people can, students can use to, to do peer review. Um, does anything come to mind for you right now, Catherine, for that question? I think what you'll see in the examples is that the focus of the peer evaluation is going to be on skill and knowledge development rather than kind of a judgment or a breakdown of the number of minutes and hours that each student contributed to the project. Um, this is also an area in which breaking down into specific roles can be helpful. Um, it can be pretty easy to identify if there wasn't an editor assigned to a paper assignment, for example. Um, and so it can be easy to identify for the instructor to identify rather than peers ratting each other out or feeling like they have to um, evaluate their peers. Um, which they can sometimes rightly think is the instructor's job and not the, the student's job. So those are two ways in which that can help with the peer evaluation process, but also asking the different classes their preference. Um, have they had experience with peer evaluation in the past? What was their positive experiences? What were their negative experiences? And then shaping your peer evaluation based on that feedback. That's a great question. And, and also, Catherine, you made me think, coming back to the idea that we don't want to assess anything we don't practice um, or teach, like it could help to do some practice a peer evaluation or low stakes peer evaluation with students leading up to um, them uh, submitting a final peer evaluation about the teamwork. Um, so again, like build the skill a little, teach them how to do it compassionately and, and you know, emphasize the metacognition. But that's a really good question. So we will circle back to that. Um, so yeah, it's always good to ask ourselves, why this assignment? Why a group assignment instead of an individual assignment? So in reassessing it, you might decide, oh, I really have to emphasize the teamwork aspect, you know, or you might say, you know, maybe this would be better as a, a duo, you know, a think pair share or an individual thing. So just something for you to think about. Um, okay, our third thing is staying involved. So we recommend, right, not just like saying, okay, group work and then walking away, right? Um, so of course, we want to be available to our students, but also even more, we recommend scaffolding the project so there are submissions or check-ins and opportunities for feedback along the way. So of course, right, students aren't, we don't want students to be surprised by their grades and them checking in with us is a good way to prepare them so they know how they're doing and how they can improve. So if there's some kind of way, right, for you to check in with their drafts of the final work or for them to share questions or even make them, you know, meet with you during class time or out of class time. Out of class time is hard for a group, but um, establishing communication pathways for students to update you on the project um, and for you to check in on their progress. And that could really be a good opportunity for them to communicate about an issue or concern. So if something is getting uncomfortable or um, just something is not working in the group, we want to give them a way to tell us that um, because it's not always just, you know, simple interpersonal conflict. It can be things like microaggressions or someone being sort of um, ignored by the rest of the group, right? We don't really know what's going on. So we do want to offer them ways to tell us when something is going wrong so that we can offer them some strategies or support. Um, so we have an image here of 
what you could do, which is an ungraded survey on Canvas, which allows you to anonymously collect student feedback about whatever, but you could use this to find out our students, how are students doing in the project? Maybe that's a place for them to tell you if they need help, if they have a question they're embarrassed you know, to ask, um, or make a way for students to let you know if something's going on with their group that you might need to intervene on or not. You probably just wanna stay aware of what's going on. But I, I will note for those Canvas surveys, um, to my understanding, they still do record the names if you wanted to look at them. And so students don't particularly trust that, um, of course, because they know it could be de-anonymized any time. So in that case, you might want to think about a different platform for anonymous, like, you know, even something handwritten, right, um, if they seem a little guarded about that. It's also very important to be transparent with your students about anonymity, but also what you can do about it. Um, lots of students think if I complain, then I can be moved to a different group or I don't have to, you know, I can do this, the assignment individually. So being very transparent with your students about what can and will happen if they submit um, issues through in their groups. Excellent. And uh, finally, we are talking about including opportunities for students to reflect. So there's that metacognitive part. So arguably just as important as taking in new information is reflecting on how you learn that information and how it's going and where you can improve. So we wanna encourage students to monitor their development and reflect on their performance. How are they practicing the relevant core skills? Where is their group entering, encountering, excuse me, success and challenges? Um, how can they improve the aspects that they aren't as strong in? So I've listed a bunch of ways that we can, um, Catherine and I provide this big, you know, you could do a, you could do a learning journal, a peer review, you could, you know, um, a, ref, a short reflective paper, like a couple of sentences, you could have them turn in the materials that they're working on with a short explanation, really whatever, I mean, I would say whatever reflects the goals of the course and the teamwork that they're doing. Um, but there's all these ways to encourage students to take a metacognitive approach to their learning and say, you know, what am I doing well in the group? What do I need to work on? You might be surprised by how honest students are. They might be like, I'm not doing a good job and I need to improve. And that's, thank you for that honesty. You know, that's great that they're, that they're facing up to that and being vulnerable like that. Um, so these are a bunch of different ways. And we could talk more about these if folks are interested. All right, so another one of those big, <laughs> those big questions of teamwork, right? Like, how do we grade? How do we grade teamwork and group work? So um, something to keep in mind is dedicated students can be deeply demotivated by group projects if their success depends on members who don't perform their share. So in that way, group grades can actually discourage effort from highly engaged students. So I could say safely that I was a big overachiever, <laughs> not anymore, but I was when I was like in college, right? And I think I would have been, you know, I would have groaned at the assignment of a project with a group grade because I think to myself, oh, my grade, I'm really, really um, focused on getting a good grade. And I feel like I'm really worried that this project is not going to represent my best effort because there's other people I have to be accountable for. And that could be very demotivating for me. So something to ask ourselves is what is being graded? Is it the final product that they turn in? Is it the design, the video, the report, the presentation, the paper, the lab report? Or are we grading the process of student collaboration? Because we are, we are asking them to practice collaboration skills. So how do we recognize that? How do we reward and assess that? So you could be grading students for how they practice organization, communication, um, equal contributions, how they fulfilled their roles, or you could do both. So there's a lot of options for you here. The group, the idea for us to reflect on is how can we grade group work while minimizing student anxiety and being fair and equitable to individual student effort? Um, Catherine, anything you want to add here? 
Yeah, as we identified at the beginning of the workshop, you know, this is one of the critical questions and the critical challenges of group work is students often feel that it's not equitable. Um, and so it's really about evaluating first whether or not a an assignment should be a group assignment or a teamwork assignment, and then really getting into the nitty gritty and scaffolding and breaking down what it is it specifically that the student is going to get out of. Um, the assignment. And I think when you encourage reflection and you're fully transparent with your students and you encourage student input, you're going to have more success and more positive experiences for students through group work. That's really well said, Catherine. All right. So let's talk about how we would grade um, our, our, you know, our efforts towards an equal and equitable way of grading. So your grading scheme, whatever it is, should reflect your goals for student learning and seek to motivate the kind of work you want to see. So if you're not sure where to start, that's a good place to start is with that A and B there. So um, we one way to think about this is assessing both group and individual contributions, right? So you can recognize that the group, you know, the team worked well together, but also that individuals worked hard on their aspect of the project. So you could include opportunities for individual reflection, for self-assessment. Um, you could ask students to set a goal for themselves. How are they going to contribute to the group? And then ask, how did you do on that goal? Um, an individual quiz about how the project is going or what they're working on. Um, you could ask them to do journal entries on what they're working on and how it's going. And you can also assess the process in addition to the product. So in addition to saying, you know, A plus on the paper, you could also say, um, you know, measure qualitatively or quantitatively, well, not measure, assess, um, the process. So things like, um, you know, the collaboration, the organization. So you could use individual team evaluations of group dynamics as a whole. So the thing that students are assessing in that is not the product that they made, and it's not quite their individual contribution. It's how they think the group worked together. So that's something you could ask them to reflect on that could be really useful for your grading. Um, you could ask students to do those individual peer evaluations of each other um, or self-evaluation of contributions. And again, you might be surprised by how honest students are um, when you encourage them, you know, to, to share. How do you think you did? Do you think that you met your own goals? Um, and of course, as always with transparency, we, we recommend making your grading scheme and criteria as clear as possible, whether that be with a rubric, a checklist, a, you know, a very clear description of what you expect of students, um, whatever it might be. And we're going to look at some examples of these different assessment types um, in a second. This can rubrics can also speed up your grading process as well, because you can literally take that rubric and copy and paste it and then annotate it um, and send it to students. And so you're modeling how you're utilizing that rubric to assess their, their assignments. And if you really want to get wacky, you can ask the students to build the rubric, which is its own thing, but is really cool because it's interesting to see. And they get a little idea of what it's like to build a rubric. It's not easy. <laughs> Um, so we have CTRL student partners here, our undergraduate students who work with us on some of our projects. We're really proud of them. Um, and they've provided, in addition to some really excellent projects um, that they've worked on, they've provided us a lot of insight about their experiences. So we like this quote. I feel like collective grading only works when you trust everyone that's in your group. And sometimes you don't. I think that the only way that you can like build the trust is through chemistry time and like consistency. So I like this quote um, because, right, the students point out how there's a sort of difference between a team and a group, sort of, right? Um, Catherine, what are your what are your thoughts here? I really love this quote because the focus is on process. And so, so often we're focused on product, we're focused on that final uh, presentation and grade and assessing the students work individually. And so this is really talking about ways in which we can assess and grade the process in addition to the product. I really like that. And, and I would say this also encourages us to try to build that trust earlier in the semester. 
instead of asking students to try to build it once they're in a group. So, you know, it, which tends to be halfway through or later in the semester is when we tend to put students in groups for projects. So just something to think about, how can you build a sense of teamwork or trust starting early in the semester um, or even starting now, right? It's never too late to start, or start cultivating that so students feel more of that, more comfortable being vulnerable in their groups. And modeling and demonstrating um, through your instruction and also through consistent um, group work and teamwork um, throughout the semester so that students have an understanding of how to be productive um, and empathetic within their groups. All right, so we are going to switch to a breakout room now. Um, so we're going to ask you just to brainstorm with the folks in your room about how teamwork can really uh, fit into your course. Um, so we're going to ask you to think about some of the learning outcomes or major overarching goals for your course. Which do you think would benefit from group work or teamwork in your, in your class? What specific benefits can you convey to students about the value of group work and teamwork to individual projects or the course as a whole? What strategies and guidance could you provide students to set them up for success? And how could this be reflected in your course documents or resources? There's a lot of questions, just something to brainstorm with your group members, your team members, perhaps, um, if you if you will, um, about um, how does how can teamwork be um, beneficial to your course um, and match up with your course outcomes? And Catherine has shared um, our template. Um, I, I'll let you talk about that, Catherine. Sorry. Yeah, sure. So this is just a template that is a table of these questions and potential strategies. So it just might be helpful in structuring your discussion um, and managing your discussion. All right, so I'm just making sure each room has a, a pretty reasonable number of people. And uh, as long as all of that is clear, um, I'll take a moment for your questions. All right, and we'll open up the rooms and we will see you all uh, in a few minutes. Catherine? Yeah. Okay, excellent. So we'll just wait until we're... There's always one or two groups that just, they get a share in and then you can't pull them back. Can't believe it. What are they doing? Sharing insight and really good ideas? <laughs> All right, I've given them a countdown. Oh, I've got one of those gnats shed. <laughs> I thought I caught it the first time and then I caught it again. So we'll see how many more times I'll catch it before this workshop ends. Welcome back you're, as you're returning from breakout rooms. Hopefully that was a helpful exercise in going over and thinking ahead as to how you can align teamwork with your learning outcomes and um, being transparent with your students about the specific benefits um, and anticipating challenges and what strategies and guidance you can provide to students um, and how you can make sure that that's reflected in your syllabi and other course documents and resources. Were there any pressing questions or issues that came up in the breakout room that you'd like to discuss? You can throw it in the chat or raise your hand. I would just like to highlight that Stephen put some great tips um, for 
their class for graduate students um, and talking about scaffolding and communicating and being transparent with students about peer evaluation and grading students individually versus as a collective. And hopefully, Sonia, you have a question or comment? <laughs> In some form or fashion, all of us kind of came across the idea of like well, how to navigate absences in the sense of like, you know, politics happen, students tune out, students, you know, are sick and don't come, uh, students get drawn into various movements and uh, happenings, you know, in, in, in places like DC. Um, how do you sort of navigate that? I think all four of us were had versions of that. Shed, I know you've personally been navigating this in your own course. So do you want to speak to that? Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, I'm so, so, you know, everyone is different about like taking attendance and things like that. That's actually what comes to mind for me is to ask the students what they think is a fair policy about it and to sort of present to them the different angles to so say, I understand things are going to happen and people are going to miss class. It's going to happen. Like even I, as the instructor, I'm going to have to skip a class now and then, but do you understand that you need to be accountable to each other with your presence and to so, sort of offer them, you know, like there, there's going to be exceptions, there's going to be emergencies and, and moments, you know, where we need rest, but you have to be accountable to your peers. So how can you sort of mediate that. So with my students in attendance, I say, you know, what's really important to me is not how many classes you're at or miss necessarily, but that you respectfully communicate to me that you're missing the class and what's going on. So maybe to encourage students that it's not necessarily, you know, we can't, <laughs> we incentivize them to show up as much as possible for one another and for our teaching, but to ask them, you know, what, what will you do if you have to miss something? How will you respectfully communicate with your peers so that they don't miss out because you weren't here? And so that's then what we're asking them to do is, um, not necessarily to be there all the time, um, which I don't think any of us expect, but to have a plan of communication and professionalism. You know, if you're in the workplace and you have to miss a day, that you don't just ghost your teammates, right? You need to update them. So I would say maybe framing it to them as a professional sort of responsibility, a scholarly responsibility is to keep your peers up to date and to be accountable for when you miss things. Um, what are your thoughts, Catherine, or any of our other folks? What do you think? Because yeah. this, this is a very good question. I, this is anecdotal, but um, for one of my classes, um, the teamwork and collaborative norm setting was really helpful in that the students felt more, um, they communicated better with each other than they did with me as the instructor. So we had a semester long team project and oftentimes if a student wasn't in class, they communicated that to their team members, but not necessarily to me, the instructor. So I would say, oh, I'm so sorry that so-and-so is absent. You know, please let me know if I can assist in, you know, the group work for the week. And the student would say, oh, I've already communicated with my group member and we've already set up a chance to talk about the assignment later this week. Um, so this is a way in which even if they are not present in the classroom, which of course we all hope and want them to be, <laughs> Um, present and engaged every time that they're in the classroom, but sometimes building those expectations and being beholden to one another um, can be a very important part of social cohesion and, um, you know, acting as a team, even when you're not in the classroom. But that's a great point, Sonia. Thanks for bringing that up based on your group's discussion. All right, so um, to kind of close out the workshop, we just have some examples and we're gonna be sharing slides and the template with you um, after the workshop. So if you miss something, no worries. And we're always here to answer questions. Um, but this is just an example of how you could scaffold a team where a semester long teamwork project um, and kind of breaking down by percentages in terms of assessment. So sometimes the hardest part of a team project is selecting uh, a topic. <laughs> Um, I certainly spent a lot of time individually with students selecting topics for final um, papers and presentations. And so 
reflecting that um, in your assessment um, can be very important, especially for teams that have differing, that it may take a few weeks of discussion um, for them to settle on a topic. Um, and then, you know, process, examining the process, encouraging them to break up into different roles, um, encouraging them to submit an outline and having that be graded. Um, and then that like final grade, you know, 30% of your grades doesn't start to look so scary at the end of the semester because you've already completed more than half of the assignment by the time you get to the final weeks when things get very busy with other classes. Um, and then breaking up presentations and papers and including um, a reflection element um, in the in the assessment as well, be it self or um, group. Any other thoughts on scaffolding, Chen? Um, I I really like this the breakdown that you provided, um, and I would add that um, like to your point, you know, rather than you know thirty percent being like pass fail, you know, feeling like so high stakes, breaking that into smaller pieces, like especially along the way. So early on, if they learn from the outline what to change so that they do better on the final paper, right? Um, so like giving them those chances to improve and build up some confidence will also help them with the teamwork confidence, skills, and knowledge, and also giving them the opportunity to give input and to give feedback to you as the instructor about how it's going. So you don't find something out two days before you have to grade the final project that, you know, two of the people were never available for assignments um, for, for group um, meetings. And so here are some examples of um, reflection templates or outlines. Um, and some language to model to students for their self or group reflections. So, you know, focusing on skills and knowledge that have been built throughout the teamwork process, what I liked most about this group, what I liked least, how we were most effective, least effective, um, things that were most helpful to the group. And this is getting them to reflect about what skills and knowledge they contributed and what skills and knowledge their group members contributed. Um, and then this can also be really helpful for them in selecting, um, you know, teams and groups for the future. Um, so oftentimes, despite our best efforts and encouragement, students are going to pick to, to be in groups with their friends. And inevitably, I'm in an office hours appointment with a student who is very frustrated because their best friend in the whole world is not the best and most effective group partner. <laughs> um, and so this kind of gets them to reflect on that process and think about what types of people they would like to work with in the future, what roles they did best at, what roles they'd like to continue to improve on, um, and what exercises were most helpful. And this is really great feedback for you as an instructor as well, um, to kind of see what was effective for this group of students, what wasn't, and this can give you kind of more tailored questions to ask your next set of students in your class. Just checking in the chat. And then here's an example. Um, I think this is the Center for Teaching in Iowa. Yes, <laughs> um, Iowa's Center uh, has a great um, group work self-reflection. And it's a two-parter. So there's self-reflection and then there's group reflection. Um, but this is just an example of a rubric talking about, you know, sharing your ideas in groups, always, sometimes, rarely. And this can be um, a great way to reflect as an individual about how you contributed to the group um, and what skills and areas you need to develop. Um, I really like the framing of the part two of this, which is that in my group, I am good at. Um, next time I will try to be better at, and I feel my group was, and in really encouraging them to kind of dig deep and um, examine what specifically about the teamwork process worked and didn't work. Oftentimes students are very black and white in their <laughs> perceptions of teamwork. And so this is a really great way to kind of dig in and, and for you as an instructor to find out what is working and what is not working about group and team projects. Anything else to add to that, Shed? I know it looks tiny <laughs> on here, but I promise there's a real version that exists in full size, which, which we will make sure you can access. <laughs> Sorry, I should have made that bigger. <laughs> It's always fun to try to, it's so fabulous. We want to share it all with you on this at the same time. It's very tiny and not very accessible. Um, and so this is the flip side. This is the, the group work reflection. So this is rather than individually focusing, this is looking at how efficiently you worked in as a group. Um, 
you can obviously adapt to specific projects, um, different environments. Um, I just really love give one specific example of something um, that you would have you learned in the group versus not alone. And again, this can help you develop your learning outcomes and um, justify why teamwork is great for this assignment. Um, and also thinking of others, you know, what's one specific example of something that other group members learned from you? And then, you know, kind of consolidating all of their, their reflections into one change that would have made an impact on, on the group's performance, positively or negatively. Um, and this is another um, quote from one of our student partners. Teamwork is rooted in the culture of the classroom. So much of that is dependent on the tone that the professor has and how they try to create a strong classroom climate. It's really helpful to create that community and also make people comfortable with the idea of group work. So this is just a great quote that kind of encompasses everything that we've been talking about in this workshop, really making sure that we as instructors are creating an environment that is productive um, and encouraging of team projects um, and making sure that we are being transparent and are staying involved throughout the process to make this a productive and successful experience for our students and for us as instructors. Anything to add, Shed? That's great. I love this quote. I know, we love our student partners, they're the greatest. So just to kind of some bullet points to sum up um, and things that can be helpful in terms of creating that environment, um, facilitate uh, your students getting to know one another. Um, we often do this on the first day of class and then completely forget about it. <laughs> for the rest of the semester. So making sure that's a consistent process um, and cultivating and really, you know, digging in and creating a conversational and casual dynamic in the classroom um, and making sure to integrate active learning um, to keep your students engaged and also to um, help facilitate um, a group work environment um, and helping guide students through norms for discussion and collaboration before we assign group work. So this isn't something that we do once we assign group work, this is something we do even before it begins. Um, and really getting student input in terms of assigning roles, um, creating groups, and um, getting feedback from our students throughout the process to help um, them be successful. Anything else, Shed? All right, so our final reflection for y'all is to think about one strategy. So we're, same with group reflection. <laughs> we're gonna ask you as, as a group to reflect what's one strategy from this workshop that you hope to utilize in your courses. Um, and you can just throw that in the chat. And I believe, yes, so. <laughs> and then of course, if you have any questions or comments, we would love to hear from you. And Lindsay, I shared a feedback survey in the chat. Um, yes, team worksheets, I think are so such a good idea. More intentional group making, love reading that, love hearing that. Um, reflection questions, awesome. I know I can work better on like um, students establishing trust with each other. So mm -hmm. like that's something that I need to work on like earlier in the semester with my students, but there's still time, right? Like there's still time to do lots of things this semester, so. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Being more intentional and transparent about peer reviews. Love that. Yeah. Ask and discuss with them. Yeah. A welcome. Yeah, exactly. Like, um, you know, the best thing we can do is create an incentivizing, you know, um, environment for students to come into, to create, you know, a, a welcoming space that they're excited to come to. And they're not always going to take the invitation, but a lot of them will, and they'll be excited too. Um, so yeah, thank you for sharing that. Lindsay's put the, the link to the survey. Um, just like we encourage y'all as instructors, we as CTRL team members really love your feedback. So please take a moment and fill out that survey so we know what to do better for next time. 